going to discuss the college rugby landscape, the difference between college, varsity, all the way to club, and all the gray area in between. Um, and I really want this to be a little bit more of a Q&A session, a conversation session, um, because this is a small room, right? And you probably don't want to hear me talk for an hour. Um, but I'm happy to go through as much of the detailed presentation as is in here, and there's quite a lot. So just to give you a little bit of information, I'm Laura Miller. I'm the head coach at Aquinas College. We're in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We're a full varsity program. I'm the head coach for the women's rugby team at Aquinas College. We all have a varsity men's program as well. Um, my background in rugby, I started playing in Southland, Indiana when I was 14 years old. Um, played college rugby, started playing WPL as a college player, and was captain of the national team the summer after I graduated college. So 22 years old at the time. Um, went on, played the WPL for about six years, played the premiership in the UK about 10 years ago. Um, played all over abroad, and um, when I retired from international play, playing at, at Glendale in Denver, um, I went straight to coaching. So I went to Life University, where I got my master's in coaching psych. I was an assistant coach there, which is how I know Coach Chow, and uh, how I can sort of pick up the ball from her, because we worked together a ton. Um, from there, I went to Alderson Broadus University, which is Neds and Women's University, that is in Philippi, West Virginia, which is in Appalachia and started both of those teams, full varsity programs. Now I'm at Aquinas College. We are a brand new women's program, which I'm starting to get here. We're from scratch. Um, so I've got quite a bit of background in the collegiate college landscape and can help sort of dig through the gray area of, like, is this a varsity team? Is it a varsity club? What's the difference, right? Um, you know, it, I know that can be challenging, especially for athletes, and even harder for families to understand who are like, why isn't this just like, NCAA being one through three, like everybody else, right? So we'll sort of talk about that a little bit. But I'd love it if we could just go around the room, since it's a small group, and say who you are, the club you're a part of, the program you're a part of, and what your role is in that club, so we can sort of fine tune this for you guys. So maybe we can start here. Um, yeah, I'm Pat with the Green Bay Youth Rugby Coach Middle School High School Girls. Awesome. Middle School High School Girls in Green Bay. Yeah. Great. Uh, Casey Doden, Purdue Men's Rugby Head Coach. Okay, we're doing that coach, great. Alex Goff, uh, Goff Rugby Report. My job is to try to explain all of this to other people. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jessica Berta, I um, work professionally for the Wisconsin Badgers, so I work with other varsity sports, um, but then I'm a youth uh, assistant coach for the high school boys team in the area, so. I'm Lisa Gleason. I'm a mom of a high school girl, a high school boy, into upcoming markers. Great. Um, and I help with the Spash rugby. Okay, so they play for Spash. My daughter plays for Spash. Yeah. Um, because we live in the middle of nowhere, we tried to create a team. Yeah. And we, we just don't have enough to be able to field a full team, so we farm our kids out. I'm uh, Tim Wonky. I'm the coach at Spash Panther Rugby, and uh, it's a high school girls yeah. club. We had uh, one of your athletes come out to one of our camps uh, yes. in November. Mouse. Uh, yes, Mouse. Yeah, we love having mm -hmm. her. Great. Uh, Alex, <laughs> where are you? I'm the coach at Catholic Memorial. At where? Catholic? Catholic Memorial. State champion. Kayla Holmes, I'm the BW Ash Ash Women's Head Coach. Okay, wonderful. Um, so we got a lot of varying backgrounds in the room. Great to hear and see that there's a lot of youth in high school folks involved in all the areas of the high school here. So before, you know, you can listen to me talk about this forever. I basically spend all of my time explaining this to families when I'm recruiting. Um, but I'm really curious, like, what questions do you have about the college rugby landscape? And or what questions do you get from parents, from families, from your players? And then we'll sort of see if we can answer those questions throughout this presentation. Any, I mean, yes, well, I think what throws off some of my parents is when they hear about the, and it's specifically for the high school girls side, because that's what I'm in, yeah. uh, the universities that are offering scholarships or tuition assistance or endowments or, you know, whatever, whatever or however they want to term the money that can help them offset the cost of going to school. And, you know, some, you know, even Lindenwood is you know, these great programs, they've never heard of those schools before. Right. And so there's no cachet there. Like, you know, I've got a player, her older sister runs cross country for Wisconsin mm. and she was a ninth grade wing and she started this year for us. 
and I'm telling her, you know, where I think her daughter could go, and her, it's just not clicking for the mom because her other daughter flip runs for Wisconsin. Okay, so there's no brand recognition. Yes. In terms of the college, right? And that's honestly, that's we'll dig into this. But it would help if they were if you turned on the TV right. more. It was you know you didn't have to live stream everything, just a little more exposure. But you know, and as a community, obviously we want those big D ones to grab a hold of our sport and run with it, right? But it, it's a phasing in process and a building process. But that's what a lot of these schools are counting on, right? Is you probably never heard of Vice College. Except that until you emailed me. Right, so I emailed yeah. you, yes. Um, but now you have yes. because we're on the team, right? So that's one of the reasons these schools are adding. Okay, what other questions about college rugby and not just for our but the whole thing? What do you get from parents? What do you get from your athletes asking questions about college? Yeah. Well, then there, there's this question going on about especially the non varsity athletic yeah. department supported team. Yeah. What does that mean? Because there's such a variety yeah. of that from a, um, you know, locally you could call Davenport a varsity program, but right. it's, a, it's under their definitions of non-varsity right. sport. Uh, but there are other ones that would still be called non-varsity and they're really just a club team right. that has like an assistant athletic director checking to make sure they don't break the, the word varsity is very much up to the interpretation of the athletic department. Um, some schools, or, yeah, and well, really, you know, to whoever is, is using the phrase, right? Because, um, cuts down as an example, right? They've considered an elevated club for a long time, but colloquially, we all know it is a varsity program because they have funding and they're supported and, and all of that. And so athletic departments sometimes, if they're an NCAA program, don't want to use the term varsity because it's only NCAA schools that get to have the board varsity. But some some programs want to, the recognition of being a varsity program, so the athletic director will just say, yeah, you can play for varsity because we pay for most of the stuff, right? So it's sort of, it's up to the interpretation. That's why it's so challenging. Um, and we're definitely, we're going to go through all of varsity, elevated club with aid, elevated club without aid, elevated um, into just, you know, sports and rec. Um, and, Pure club that's just run by the players. We're going to dig through all that, and um, all of that is still the categories are still blending together, right? So what I always tell every athlete that I'm recruiting um, or who I'm talking to, talk to the college coach and ask them how do you how is your college you know understood on your campus? Do they consider you varsity? Do they consider you a club team? Because you know I might say cuts down is X, but the cuts down coach might say something completely different, and he knows better than me because he's in charge of that program, right? What other questions do you get from families or do you have from yourself or from players? Not just about, about the recruiting process, but the expectations. What other questions do you guys have? Any more? Well, at, yeah. depending on how the team is designated at the university, what kind of facilities and support they will receive. Yeah. Are they going to have trainers at practice? Right. You know, do they have their own team time to be in the weight room? And is it going to be midnight or yeah. 1 a.m. Yeah. like it is for clubs Ooh. in Wisconsin that want to get indoors? Right. They get the real choice times. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and again, that's going to be dependent on the program and on the, how much space the coach can negotiate a lot of the time, right? And schedule ahead of time. Okay. So obviously, we, we are all kind of aware of these categories. Right? We might know that there are varsity, and varsity can mean a lot of different things. Varsity can mean NCAA, which NCAA program might consider only NCAA programs to be varsity, so only a, a women's NIRA team might fit in that category. Um, an athletic department might, for example, I'm at an NAIA school. We're not an NCAA program, but we are varsity. And our athletic department considers us varsity, even though we don't have an NAIA rugby league that we compete in. Um, Not my computer, sorry guys. Okay, we'll see if this will hold for me. All right, so first we can be a D1, D2, D3, NAIA. Um, university supported with athletic aid. A lot of times this means that they might fund travel, they might pay your coach, 
you might have preferred uh, facility use, you might have an athletic trainer associated with it, and a very important <coughs> athletic aid is provided. I am not the expert on every program's individual ability to support students, so always ask the coach of a program. But many schools, especially those competing at a high level, um, you know, might fall into one of these two categories, kind of depending on where they are in their development as a program. So obviously university supported without aid might mean that they are, again, they're getting facilities, athletic trainer, they might have a recruiting budget, they might have an operating budget, they might have a paid coach, but they're just not providing any financial aid. Elevated club, elevated club could simply be a club that is alumni supported, that has a significant endowment. Right? It could be a club that's getting some money from the school, like maybe the school just pays for transportation, or if you get to a national championship, they'll pay for your vans, or they'll pay for your warm-up jerseys, right? But they don't pay for anything else, and it's completely player-run. The majority of these two bottom categories are completely player-run, meaning the players are running the board, doing all of the administrative work, figuring out all the travel, hiring the athletic trainer, who's not an employee of the school, right? It's coming in. These programs, are vastly different in the experience of the athletes, but neither are good or bad, right? Both have really wonderful experiences. I played for a club in college, and I left college with this amazing resume of all of these rugby administrative skills. And I was like, I took my team to do this, and I was on the team, right? And you know, we got to this championship, and I was playing it, being the captain, right? And so if you're a player who is you know, a real self-starter, but doesn't want to be at the varsity level, a really good solid club could be a, a great experience for an athlete. Um, any, okay, feel free to just put your hand up if you guys have questions or thoughts. I'm not the, you know, only person who spends a lot of time thinking about this, so happy to have this be a little bit more of a discussion. Yes? The other, the other element that factors in, um, first of all, financial need, yep. and then second, secondarily, or maybe even primarily, uh, the academic tracks. Yes. I've had players who got an offer, they could have done it, but they just didn't have what they wanted to study there. And so yep. they, went, they went to the school right. that had the academics they wanted, and then they played club, or maybe they didn't have, there was no rugby there at all, and they, and they, were, they okay. were going to college. Right, exactly. You know? Yeah, and um, we're gonna talk a lot about fit for college as well, because I, you know, I work big full time right now. I'm starting a team from scratch, and so I'll sometimes send a, an athlete a athletic aid award, and you see that it's so excited, right? They should be very proud of themselves, and they earn this award, and they get, you know, sometimes choose a school because they simply got scholarship to go there, right? And that is not the only reason to choose a school. Obviously, financially, is incredibly important. It's the linchpin that makes it all possible, but. If you are, especially for women, but for men as well, if you're a high school athlete who wants to play at the varsity level, there is a coach in this country who will work for you, period. There are, our sport is growing at the varsity level so quickly that new teams being added constantly, and we're all looking for players. And we're looking for players who are a great fit for our program, right? So the challenge isn't that there aren't players for me to recruit, it's the connection to find them and to find the ones that are a fit for me, right? And lots of college coaches here, you can ask them all the same thing, they'll probably say something similar, right? The hardest part is, is the connection to find the program, because no one has heard of Aquinas yet, because the team doesn't exist, right? So, varsity rugby versus university sponsored with aid. A lot of things in, in common, right? Um, the big difference is the athletic department, to be a varsity program, you really have to be housed in athletics, right? You have to have a coach who is hired by the athletic department, very rarely are they volunteer coaches. Sometimes they are part-time employees, but most of the time it's going to be the full-time job. Any university sponsored that is not in the athletic department would be considered a club or an elevated program, but they're usually housed in um, a rec sports department or a student life department. And sometimes, but not always, the athletes have a much bigger hand in the running of the club. Again, the answer, just like every rugby practice, the answer is always it depends, right? Same thing. It, the answer always depends. So building relationships with college coaches is really the most important piece because you want to be able to ask them questions and get honest answers about their programming and you know what their expectations are and what resources they have. So um, many, but not all, varsity programs are governed by a body that is not a rugby governing body, the NCAA or the NAIA. 
So obviously all women's NIRA teams are governed by NCAA policy as a promoting sport. Now, I'm in an NAIA school, but there is no NAIA rugby. We are not an emerging sport in NAIA. That happens to be a pet project of mine that I'm hoping is going to take a little bit more shape in the next few years because there's lots of NAIA programs popping up. But all that to say is that I have to follow NAIA guidelines, but my athletes don't have to, for example, register as an NAIA athlete because there is no NAIA rugby. So again, a lot of gray area, right? The answer is usually ask the coach what we have to do. Uh, Full-time staff versus sometimes compensated staff um, or completely volunteer, depending on the program. Um, academic support, and not just academic support, but academic requirements for a varsity program. So the majority of varsity programs um, not only have additional academic support for athletes, but have additional requirements for either tutoring or study hall or collaborative learning environments, right? Like we have an organization called CORE, which is the Center uh, for Opportunities, Resources, and Excellence. That's why we call it CORE, it's too long a name. Um, but all first year students um, on my team are required to do a certain number of hours with CORE every week. And that's not just like a quiet study hall. It's either with a tutor or you're in a collaborative learning environment where you're being retaught a lecture that you've already heard once, right? Um, and those hours are based on the individual student and how much they need. So we work to build that out. And a lot of programs are the exact same way. Um, a dedicated program, uh, university supported, but they may or may not have that, right? So you've got to ask the coach. Uh, dedicated facilities, access to weight room, medical care, the majority of our supermarkets have that, right? And it's, yes, a little bit of a negotiation with everyone around you to make sure you have choice times for those spots. Um, like, for example, we have an indoor turf facility. Um, we had a camp last weekend. I scheduled um, that whole camp about six months in advance so that I could make sure, right, that I had those, those slots available um, for, those, for those athletes who were coming in. Um, and I think with any sport, as the rosters become larger, it becomes far more likely that you're going to get the times that you want because they want to serve the greatest number of athletes. So if you have a 40 person roster, it's much more likely you're going to get a week of time that you want. So those are all things to be aware of, right? Um, supported with aid, you probably will have access to facilities, but it might not be the varsity athletic facilities. It might be a sports and rec facility. But again, it depends on the individual program. Um, in some cases, athletic scholarships. I would say in many cases, athletic scholarships. Um, NCAA D1 schools don't offer athletic scholarships, but to my knowledge, most other programs do offer some kind of athletic scholarship. For the majority of programs, the largest chunk is going to be an academic aid. So, like for example, Aquinas, if there's a 4.0, automatically reduced like 50% of your aid if you cut it with a 4.0. And the rugby scholarship job is simply to fit in and make sure that it is affordable for that student to attend if we are their first choice. And that's how most coaches sort of use their financial aid. I have very few, if any, full rides you know, in our sport. Um, for the most part, the scholarships tend to be much smaller, um, and they're used to make sure that you know, if I'm your first choice, it's my job to help this become affordable for you, because I want you to be at my school. So we sort of use them to fit in um, to the budget that is set by the family. And I encourage all families who are trying to have their player recruited to sit down and have an honest conversation about, OK, you know, rugby scholarships, they're out there, but they're probably not going to be a full ride. What are we able and willing to pay for this student to attend college? And then know that when you're talking to coaches. And if that number doesn't fit their model, you know right away that make that school's not possible. Or that you have to find something else in order to make that school possible for your, for your child. Okay. So, university-sponsored without aid, an elevated club. See, all of this is a lot of minutia, right? A lot of gray area. How are these all different? Well, they're different in terms of resources that they get. And I think that there are some clubs that I might throw into one of these categories and then you ask the coach and they'll be like, well, we're really more of a elevated club or we're really more of a this, right? So what questions do you guys have about resources available for athletes at the college level, if any? 
Yeah. Well, I, well, I think that um, just for the, the team, uh, things like uh, athletic trainers or even, you know, somebody to, is it, the field on campus? Yeah. It, who's lining the field? Right. Uh, is there someone to to help set it up or, or put ropes up or things like that? Or is that all on the team? Um, but yeah, th those sorts of questions uh, arise for sure. Yeah, so, you know, is the student's job only to be a student athlete or do they have a hand in being a coach or an administrator in any way, right? And I think with a lot of clubs, and a lot of programs in general, the older the students get, the more of a hand a coach might expect them to take in running the program. Whether that's simply, you know, being a team leader and maybe running a, a team dinner, right? Or, um, you know, at the club level, when I played club rugby in college, we were the ones that lacked a deal, right? We were the ones who established our budget every year. We had a meeting for exec board and we'd say, this is what we're gonna ask the school for, but very small, right? But we would try to ask for as much as we could. Um, and we would get, for us, we got our vans covered for transportation, that was all we could get, right? Um, so awareness of the different types of uh, resources that are available. So, you know, an elevated club might offer no athletic aid at all, but you might have access to amazing facilities to work out in. And if that school has a major that you want, or you really love the culture on campus, right, that might be a perfect fit for, for you. Um, you know, these categories are, they really all blend together. And there's really, you know, these categories don't necessarily, like all the elevated clubs in the country don't play each other necessarily, right? It's not, that's not how we organize competition. So, you know, this is where it becomes challenging for families particularly to understand um, because we may have an elevated club playing against a, a true club that is completely student run, and the elevated club might be consistently winning. Well, it's because they have access to weight room facilities and they have you know some compensation for their coaches, so they're a little bit paid. Um, so, being aware of the resources that are available to your student athletes is you know really something that I, I, I hope that athletes are becoming more and more aware of. That they should be asking questions of you know well. Um, you know, do we get weight, weight room time? Do I have an athletic trainer at all of my practices? Do I have access to the coach? Is this the coach's full-time job or are they part-time, right? Okay. And then, you know, club, again, a true club to me is completely player run with a coach who is maybe compensated for gas, the time, um, but it's truly really at the end of the day a volunteer. Um, and that the players are taking the biggest hand in the management of the team, choosing the level of competition. They negotiate with uh, sports and rec or student life for field times, right? They're the ones doing that communication. These organizations usually have a faculty sponsor on campus who's technically the adult in charge of the program, not necessarily the coach of the program. Um, and these are the programs I played for. I went to St. Mary's College of Maryland in Southern Maryland, and this is where we were. Um, and like I said, I left college with a long list on my resume of things that I had done as an administrator for this program. And so there's immense value in these programs as well. And there are hundreds and hundreds of schools like this in our country, especially in the Midwest, they're all over the place, as I'm sure you guys know. So, okay. How to get recruited, recruitment procedures. Um, it really varies. So in the last group, I had a mixed group of, of folks, um, some were, uh, from Stevens Point Hill College players, and um, I asked them, you know, how do they recruit? They're, you know, a true club, they're completely run by the team. Uh, how do they recruit? And they're like, well, we just recruit on campus, right? We don't recruit from high schools, we only recruit on campus. So that's how a lot of programs operate, right? Um, they only recruit on campus, and if you're in a bigger school, that's great, right? You've got a huge pool of people to, to pull from. Um, what you'll notice is, like, us smaller guys, or really only going to be recruiting on campus, right? I do some on-campus recruiting, but for the most part, I would say 85, 90 percent of the players on my team are going to have played high school, right? So we'll talk about varsity recruiting, which is, um, you know, we're, we're learning as a community how to recruit and be recruited. Um, for varsity athletics, we are so young as a sport in the NCAA, and we are so young as a sport 
that is actually funding um, college rugby in a real sense. And so there's a lot that I think parents and coaches can learn about how to um, support their athletes and, and making the best decision, and also making sure all the opportunities are available as well. Um, okay, in terms of recruitment, questions that you get from players or parents, or questions that you have generally about college rugby recruiting, not just varsity, but all college rugby recruiting. What kind of things come up for you guys from your teams? I guess really the questions are how do we how do we find this program? Mm -hmm. Right, so is, is there a best way to go about it? I mean, a lot of us have been around the game a while. We've got connections. We can make four or five, six phone calls. Well, how do we get those parents and those players to do a little bit of legwork on their own so yes. it's not me calling everybody? Great. Uh, yes. Consistent question is, like, how do I get started? Yeah. Right? When it's possible? Uh, what other question? I have to go in the back. Oh, uh, I was, uh, like, for the True Varsity programs that are under NCA guidelines, I mean, they're limited. They can't contact freshmen and right. sophomores, you know? Right. And so that's like the, for, the question I, I know what your program is when you ask me what grades your player in. Yes. And they're yes. like, well, I'll talk to her next year. Right. And uh, right. Um, so that's like, you know, the availability of just that contact and, mm -hmm. and. Uh, awesome. Any, any other questions? Yeah. So yeah, we'll, we'll definitely get into both of those things. Um, so. Who are, who are we recruiting, right, as coaches? Who are we looking for? What methods? How are we going to recruit? When is it appropriate? This varies depending on you know, how you're structured, um, who you're governing by, yes. Where do we recruit? Why? So why are we looking outside of our own, our own college? Um, and how do you do it ethically, right? So who do we recruit? OK, so you asked about like awareness of programs. So you can probably talk about next phase a little bit. Um, yeah. Um, you, you want to say it? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, so on the, on uh, the, on Golf Rugby Report, we started a database of all of coaches that, that morphed into an app uh, called Next Phase Rugby. Uh, kids tomorrow on the combine are going to get a Next Phase Rugby T-shirt, um, but it's an app that. Uh, high school students and college uh, program directors or, or coaches download and use, and, and it's a, it's conduit between the two. So that's one way is you get the app and then you go on there, and so you'll see dozens of college programs out there, and and you know if they've done their profile properly, then you go and see what they have. Um, and I, I might also say, you know, I. I People look at the rankings that I do, or the rankings that Jackie Finland does on the yeah. Rugby Breakdown, um, to at least see a list. Yeah. Right? I know these teams are good at rugby. Yeah. These these colleges. So then let's pick and choose on these any colleges that I'm interested in. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's not that's not like all in couples. So I will say, as a college coach and the other coaches I think we're just talking, about, I'm in that state constantly, all the time. Because I'm, I'm building a team completely from scratch right now. But the thing I like most about Next Phase is that it's player centered, in that um, I get a lot of it. I can see a player profile, I can see what they're interested in, academic interest, GPA, all kinds of stuff, right? But I can't contact them unless the player gives me permission to do so. So what happens is I request, hey, I'd really love to talk to you, can I have your contact information? And it will give, it, if they say yes, then I can contact them. But if they don't want to talk to me, they're not going to be harassed, right? They're not going to be bugged by a coach that they're not interested in. The other great thing about it is it gives parent contact information, which is always very, very hard to find as a college coach. Sometimes a uh, coach might email me and say, hey, that's a great player. I think she's a great fit. I CC her on this email. Or here's her phone number. Great. Thank you so much. I love having referrals from coaches that want to talk to those players. But I'm recruiting minors for the most part, right? These are young women who are mostly like 16 and 17, and I want to talk to the parents also, right? And I want it to be a player-centered conversation. I'm talking to the athlete, and very often there's a parent sitting there or listening in or around, right? And I'm talking to the athlete, but um, I want the parent to know I sent them an email or sent them a text, right? I always want, if I have a phone number, I want to send the text to the athlete and the parent at the same time and say, like, hey, so-and-so, I saw you play. I'd love to talk to you about Rice College. 
parents on into, right? That's a perfect world. Now, we're not there yet as a community. We're definitely not, because that's how I want to recruit, but the, the information is not necessarily out there. And I'm also trying to give the opportunity to as many athletes as possible, right? So we don't have to slip the cracks. So here at Project Information, wonderful. If you have a the kind of coach who wants to send players to a coach, keep it up, but try to add a parent, guardian, whatever adult is best, um, is always the best practice, I think. So, um, who do we recruit? I'm looking for athletes that have a very specific focus. Athletes who want to play rugby in college, are ready for college, academically ready, love my school, and want to build something new. That's very specific. Every college has something very specific that they're looking for. Right? When I was at Life University, we wanted athletes who want rugby 24-7, work high performance, we're competing at a high level, we're all doing this all the time. We're always together, right? So it's a very different experience. And we want athletes who want that, who want to be a part of that. Um, understanding a team's core values could be really important, understanding you fit within that program. So college visits are huge. Um, I run virtual visits too. I do a lot of webinars because I don't want the inability to visit due to cost, keep someone away from our college. Um, that's who we recruit, right? We recruit people who want what we want. That's what we try to do. Uh, what methods? So, again, student athlete centered, we try to have an effective recruiting to find people who are fit for us. But, um, you know, the methods vary. I run webinars a lot because I don't want the inability to visit. And I have a recruit in Texas, and they're like, man, coach, it's really expensive to fly to Michigan. Um, you're right, right? We've got a webinar coming up that you can be a part of. Um, we all, I mean, next phase, we, most coaches have a database of contacts that they've had for years, right, that they've collected over the course of years. Like, I have a sign-up sheet. Um, every outlet that comes up to the sign-up sheet, I say, you know, would you like us to send you emails about our camps and about our program? If they want, they can add their contact information onto that. And we email them about our camps. Um, obviously, a lot of it is happening electronically, especially with COVID, but campus visits are incredibly important. Um, because you're going to live there for four years. It's going to be your home. So we really push visiting a campus before making a decision if you can. If you can. So when is it appropriate to recruit? Are you an NCAA program or not? And where are you as an NCAA program? Are you D1 or are you D3? Because there's completely different sets of rules, right? So I always say, ask the coach. The coach, don't, don't assume, oh, they're an NCAA coach. I can't talk to them right now. Well, if they're a Division III coach, maybe they can't, because they have a completely different rule book than D1s. And we wouldn't want a person to miss out on an opportunity because they thought they couldn't talk to somebody. But you go up to a coach and you say, hey, coach, I'd love to talk about Harvard. Harvard's D1. The coach might say, hey, you're in the middle of a competition. I can't talk to you while you're competing. But when you're released from the competition, I'll be here, come up and have a conversation with me. So there's a lot of rules that it's not your job necessarily to manage. It's definitely the coach's job, if they're an NCAA coach, to know if they're in violation or not. For the most part, a player should not be penalized if they're talking to a person that they shouldn't, right? The coach should say, no, we can't talk right now. Come talk to me when the turn gets over. Or send me an email tomorrow, and we'll get the phone, you know? Um, there are dead periods for the NCAA. Times where coaches cannot send emails, cannot text a recruit, cannot communicate in any way. Um, social media can be a bit of a gray area there. Again, it depends are you D1, 2, or 3. Uh, in addition, when is it appropriate to recruit? If a recruit says to you, I don't, I'm not interested in your school, it stops being appropriate to recruit that athlete, right? And so as coaches, this is probably something that you know um, may have come up or that you're aware of. If a student says, I'm not interested, then that college coach should backing off, right? He's like, okay, I'm going to move on and talk to somebody else. Um, where do we recruit? So geographic areas certainly, but not primarily, right? I'm starting a program here in the Midwest, and I'm so fortunate. There's so many high school girls teams in the Midwest as a whole. So I've spent the last six months mostly just staying in the Midwest, but not just focusing on that. I'm going to spend all spring. I'm going out to New Jersey. For their combine, I'm going to go to North Carolina Rugger Fest, right? I'm going to bounce all over um, and make sure that I'm not missing out on any opportunities to recruit an athlete. Uh, but a lot of athletes only know about the varsity program that's closest to them and maybe think that that team is the only varsity program or the best one 
to that. And so I think apps like NetSpace or any way that we can show like uh, recruiters rooms like this that show all these different programs, great ways to show that it's not just the varsity program that's closest to you, but there's many, many available. So again, why do we recruit? Well, you know, for small colleges, um, many of them are adding rugby because they see we have large rosters of enthusiastic folks who want to be a part of this college, right? And so the, large, the fact that we're a large roster is a huge asset to a lot of these colleges who want to bring in a lot of people who are enthusiastic about that school in particular. And they see that now all of a sudden people know about a program at a school that they never would have known about before. So that's part of the why. And how to do it ethically, we've talked a lot about this already. Um, you know, trying to include the parents as much as possible while also centering the student athlete because it's their decision ultimately um, where they go, um, including the coach as much as possible. Um, and also being aware that if a student decides, hey, I'm not interested in this program, that it's time for the college coach to, to talk to somebody else. All right, tips for high school coaches. So we talked about next phase, yes? Um, just when you said geography, yeah. I was two things popped into my mind. I've only been aware of them online and following them the last two years, um, and so I know you know all about them. What's up with Sparta Rock? You what about them? I mean, they, they look really solid. They look really good. Yeah, they are. You know, um, you know, and they seem to dominate in the state of Michigan. I just haven't seen them, you know, so, them blowing people away at Midwest or going to nationals because, um, you know, we're, I'm, we're sitting in the room with Catholic Memorial and you know, and Divine Savior dominated. Right. So Coach Gowser is here this weekend. You can probably ask him. Okay. Um, I do think that they will be, that some of the players on their team have told me they were going to be, maybe going to tropical okay. this year. But yeah, it really, you know, part of the challenge is, I'm not going to speak for that program, but I'm guessing that the pandemic has kind of put a damper on their ability to leave the region. Uh, that's a guess. Sure. Uh, and I do know a significant number of those players are on the Thunderbird squad going to Florida okay. um, in a couple of weeks. So yeah, he's here. He's and also, to... you know, thinking about so like um, uh, some of the some of the players you'll uh, that will be at the combine from Wisconsin here play for Badger Selects. Yeah. And then some of those same players will also play for Wisconsin All Stars. Yep. And you know, it's just it, you know, it's nice to have a regional yep. uh, rivalry. You know, no one in Minnesota is playing high school girls' 15s. Right. Um, it's all sevens there. Iowa is putting together a 15s all-star team. Yep. And, but we've competed against Illinois. I coached with Badger Slides in the past. So we've played Illinois, Indiana, yep. and had uh, a lot of fun and good competition and um, seeing what's possible. And then at, with you at Aquinas, who are you going to who are you going to play? Well, it's going to change um, as we go. So we will certainly do our first year. We'll only be sevens. Um, we're probably going to start an NCR. Whether or not that will be D1 or small college is to be determined. I'm going to kind of wait and see the athletes who choose us because we make that determination. But the way I'm scaling it is the, the goal is to next fall, fall 22, play a developmental fall season. Ideally, that would be 15s, but it could be 10s, depending on the numbers, right? So we're going from zero to full roster. Uh, the goal of that developmental season will be to play Davenport's B-side, Adrian College's B-side, um, Grand Valley's B-side, right, state regional, because my team next year is going to be 90% freshmen. Sure. I don't want them traveling all over and not going to class, because they're exhausted. Right? Can you, can you, or can any uh, university college program, based on skill, can you cross over and play teams freely? I mean, everyone's under the USA Rugby umbrella, at least. It um, depends. So I think it is a pretty big long shot for my program to get into the Big Ten anytime soon. Yeah. So if we were to go USA Rugby route, we'd have to be an independent team. So then I sort of have free reign to play who I want, but I also need to make sure we're playing good enough teams that aren't a flight away every time I want a good game. Right? So I mean, this is part of the challenge of sure. it. So what I'm planning on is developmental 15 slash 10s next fall, fall 22, competitive sevens, spring of 22. Again, this is a 90% freshman roster. Um, that will likely be an NCR. I'm actually kind of waiting to see how they handle sevens this spring. They're still a relatively new organization to sort of determine that. And then fall of 23, so now by that time I've got sophomores and freshmen, <laughs> maybe a couple older kids. Um, that'll be our, our true 15s launch in fall of 23. 
Um, and then by then, I would hope that we're at the very least in CRD1 or USA Rugby D1. And because I, there's a, yeah. I mean, the Great Waters Conference has so many teams, mm -hmm. and yeah. you know, and you know, including NMU. Right. So I mean, um, yeah, just you know, there's a lot of rugby to be played, and just wondering about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I and mean, you know, I think um, the challenge of building it from scratch is you don't know until the players really show up, right? Until they commit. Uh, and to see what the skill level is. And the first question is always safety, uh, because coming from high school rugby, some of the programs are very good about scrum safety, tackle safety. Some, it's a total question mark as to the, the readiness for college rugby. So we're certainly not gonna throw them into competition. That's gonna result in too many injuries that will then kill my roster numbers, but also impact their experience, right? So that's you know something that we have to manage. Um, so in terms of recruiting and tips for high school coaches, we talked about player profiles. Some of you guys are going to get information on Next Phase. There are so many guys in Next Phase, and so few women. And I'd love to see many, many more young women jumping in Next Phase, if only so they can see what the options are available to them. If you are a high school player, boy or girl, and you want to play varsity rugby, you can do it. It is possible. There is a coach that wants to recruit you out there somewhere. It's just about you sort of putting your hand up and saying, this is what I want. Not just varsity rugby, but I want varsity rugby, I want a small school, and I want somewhere that has a really good education program. Right? That, that program exists, right? Or I want a really good education program and I don't want to be more than six hours from home. Right? That program exists, right? For that student, um, it's about putting their hand up and trying to find it. Um, same thing goes from financial aid. There's a lot of different ways that we can find a different school that are not just rugby. And when you're recruiting, we become like a guide through the college process, not just for my school, but for all of them. Because I'm actively, especially if it's the oldest child in the family, very often I'm actively teaching the whole family how to go through the college process. Not just the application process, but the FAFSA. And not just the FAFSA, but okay, you got your FAFSA, you got your academic award, you got your review award, we still need to find X amount of money. What independent scholarships are available? Well, I know quite a few, right? I'll send you a list, right? Or, like my school, a lot of schools have this, have a uh, funded scholarship competition uh, that they can attend if they've been accepted. And that might fill in the gap that they need to, to pay for the rest of school. So this is all about keeping an open line of communication with the coach, because if, if you get your FAFSA, your financial aid package, and you just think, oh wow, that's too expensive, I can't do it, and write that school off, you might be losing out on an opportunity. But if you say, hey coach, I really like your school. I want to be part of the team, I love the program, you're my first choice, but I need to find $3,000. Well, the coach might have an answer for you. They might be able to help you with that. So keeping that line of communication is really, really important. And the more you can encourage athletes to do that, the better. Um, preferred communication. This goes both ways. So if you fill out a recruit form, most colleges have them, but actually programs, there's a little button on there that says, how would you like us to contact you? If you hit the text message button, you should expect to get texts from the admissions office, right? And you can always hit and say stop, right? And send that, it'll stop texting you. Uh, but be aware of that, right? And if you say only you communicate with me by email, the student should be checking their email and responding promptly and not three months. Like uh, Karen's talking today, talking about recruits responding three months later and not answering any of the questions, I guess, right? In the email. So open line of communication and uh, responding with the information we need. Like all the time I have athletes apply to a finance, but don't necessarily give us their official transcripts. And then they wonder why we didn't get accepted. Well, it's because we can't process your application if we have the transcripts. And I sent you an email about that. Did you get it? Right? Uh, so communication goes both ways. And the coach might also say, hey, I don't like to text recruits, so can you email me? Right? Or you might not get the coach's cell phone number. So a lot of athletic programs have a, uh, a, um, a database and a program that monitors communication. So you might be texting a number that's actually a monitored recruiter number that the coach has access to, but then there's a lot of levels of um, communication in there. So the athletic director can see every text that a student sends. The uh, direct report for the coach can see every text, and you can have a setting in there that you add in a parent phone number, and every text the student gets, the parent also gets. So the parent can see when a coach is texting or if a coach is texting their child. That's what a lot of schools do. Um, I think it's a great way to protect everybody. Um, film. So film is a tricky one, right? Um, edited film, 
makes you look great, um, not necessarily accurate um, to the player's ability or skill level. Um, as a coach, if you send me film, I will absolutely watch it. But I prefer to see a whole game and watch the entire game. And I'm not just watching you, I'm also watching when you're on the sidelines, are you cheering? And are you the one who's running the water up to the kicker? And how do you actually get scored on? And tell me your jersey number and what jersey you're wearing, please, right? If you're, well, if you tell me, okay, I'm 15, but there's a green 15 and a blue 15, and I've never heard of your school before, it doesn't really help me, right? So being detailed, right? I'm playing for Smash, I'm wearing this color, I've got number one on my jersey, this is my name. I'm also wearing yellow cleats. The right healthy find the athlete is really, really helpful. Um, accurate evaluations from coaches, right? Um, and, you know, it really depends on the program, it depends on the individual coach, but genuine, honest um, evaluation of your player, not just on the field, but who they are as a human, because that's what we're recruiting, right? I'm recruiting this whole human to come to my school. I'm not just recruiting their kicking ability. And I want to know how do they interact with their teammates. When you reach out to them, do they respond? When you say, hey, don't forget your mouth for our practice, are they the kid that brings it, right? Are they the one who brought extra for their teammates, right? Or are they the one you're always tracking down because they need to get it work in, right? Those are the things we want to know. And we also want to know accurate information. Um, not just, oh, this kid is the you know great runner, this kid is great at this, um, because we're going to find out one way they come to a camp, they end up at the program, um, the relationship building between college coaches and high school coaches is so important, right? Because we want to create funnels from programs to get multiple students every single year coming from programs. And so accurate information from high school coaches is so important. And opportunities to be seen by recruiters. So you guys actively taking your players to events like there's all these high school girls here this weekend. That's awesome, right? Because they're actively coming out and saying, wow, all these coaches want to talk to me, right? And I could be a varsity athlete if I wanted to be. And I'm going to show up at this combine tomorrow, and all these coaches are going to get my contact information, and maybe some of them will reach out and want to chat, right? Um, not only events like this, but Tropical Sevens, right? Uh, North Carolina Rubber Fest. Last year we had Falcon Sevens out in Arkansas as a showcase event. So seeking out specific events that um, co you know college coaches are at. And those are growing. We have more and more um, Midwest championships. Definitely going to be a lot of college coaches there. So, okay. And for players, um, the must have, the, the most important thing is really GPA. Um, the vast majority of aid comes from academic scholarship, period. Pretty much every school across the board is the same one. Large chunk of academic aid, right? Little bit of rugby scholarship. That's how most programs work. Not to speak for everybody, but that's how most programs work. The academic scholarship is dependent almost entirely on GPA now. It used to be GPA test score, but more and more schools, due to COVID, are getting rid of test score as a requirement. We're currently test optional. They're, they haven't gotten rid of it completely, but a lot of schools are taking this opportunity to say, you know what, the test is really not helping us identify if the student's a good fit. What's great is GPA and recommendations and an interview. Those are great ways to determine if the student's a fit. So the GPA might be the only metric that says how much academic scholarship you're getting. Um, film links, yes, I, I, you know, I either want to have seen the person play or at least watch film before I give them an offer. Um, but if it's impossible to get film, it's not, it doesn't mean that they're not going to get an offer. Right? If there's no film at all, it doesn't mean that they're not going to be. That's where the relationship really comes in. And if you've really worked hard um, to get to know the coach, if the family has got to know the coach, ask critical questions, come for a visit, um, most schools are going to give some kind of an offer. So, academic fit and fit for rugby. So, again, this is not my presentation, but these two things are very important, right? Are the academic aspirations aligned with the choice that the student is making? They're not just major, because I would say many students, if not most, show up at college, think they're going to be a nursing major, decide when they get there, oh wow, all these labs are really intense, maybe I'm going to switch my major into something else, right? But um, making sure that the academics are in line with what that student um, is ready for, and also that their interests are there, so multiple interests, making sure one or two of them are there. Um, 
the volume of rugby and the balance of academics, athletics, and also student life, right? It's not just school and rugby. There's a whole social life that they're having on a campus. Um, so, so like, when I was at like, university, I was talking about how it was 24 7 rugby all the time, right? And that's what we wanted was high performance athletes who wanted to be there to compete and become the absolute best that they could be. But those students, you know, did not necessarily always join a club, right? They might, um, but for the most part, it was school rugby, right? Whereas some of the small and large schools, especially D3, NCAA D3, pride themselves on having a balanced experience of academics, athletics, and um, student life. So the only thing I would add, if you're in here, is fit for the campus, the physical campus itself. Do you feel good there? Do you feel safe there? Do you, the people around you, do you want to be friends with them, right? When you join the team, do you like the players on the team? Do you want to be a part of this group? Because student life is so incredibly important, often overlooked. Um, but those three pieces really should be in line in addition to the finances, making sure that those work out. And those things make up the fit for college, not just do they have a university or review program, or do they have a major, it's very specific, that I want. So I just gave a ton of information, and we talked for almost an hour. Any thoughts or questions, comments, things you, that I've sped through that you want to know more about? As long as, yeah. Um, just the one thing I'm jumped out at me on, on recruiting is I see a lot of college recruiters show up at high school nationals, mm -hmm. major championships, and from from what you're saying about um, the, the, the college opportunities is that there are players who aren't on select sides or aren't on national championship contenders mm -hmm. who could be recruited, and, and maybe it behooves the college coaches to show up at the preseason jamboree, yeah. or you know, the one where there's a high volume, and, and it's also maybe it's uh, the the high school coaches or the, the high school league could be inviting colleges at the beginning of the season. Yes. yes. It's like, hey, don't don't judge us too harshly on our standard of plays right. at the beginning of the season. But there's a lot of players, some of whom would be not great see the playoff time. Right? right, and and that's kind of a misconception, right? Is that all, we're only looking for players on the select side. We're only working for the players from the teams that make it to national. And what we're looking for, for the most part, is fit for campus, fit for our academics, and fit for our individual team cultures. You know, do you want to be on this team? Are you academically ready for the level of rigor that we have at this school, right? So is it is it a fit? And the challenge, this is why I think next phase is really great, is I don't know who those players are, right, who don't make the all-star team. But they know what they want. They know that they want to go to a small school within a six-hour drive that has a varsity rugby and a nursing program, but they don't know who the hell that school is. So they can get into a database and see all of these colleges and then self-select who they want to talk to and it's player directed or player centered uh, makes it a lot easier for all of us so encouraging your players to get an x-face profile is really the first step in my opinion uh, and as a coach i am always interested in talking to high school coaches about their athletes not just the ones who made the all-star team I want to know about the athletes who are just in love with rugby and didn't even know that they could go play in college, right? I want to know about the ones who, man, maybe they're a little bit free, afraid to talk to me, but you know that they're going to be a good fit at the right college. Like, I want to know about all of them, um, because that's what we all need to do to continue to raise the level of competition. So, any other questions? All right. Well, thank you guys.